So welcome. This is, as far as I know, the first EMA fireside briefing that's being held in Norway. We have been discussing this for some time. How many are familiar with EMA? Not many. Okay. EMA is a European think tank that was founded in 1987, so it's been around for a long time. Um, EMA has a yearly annual conference that's going to take place in, uh, in London. Uh, June 8th and 9th. Uh, there's also a more technical conference, typically in, uh, in November. End of November, we're going to have it this year. Um, and it's about bringing resources together, discussing, presenting, uh, talking about topics that we're going to talk about today. Uh, EMA also has firesides. Uh, and a fireside is what we have today. We bring in some experts to, to present a topic. And then it's an open discussion, not between only the experts but between everybody. So we want to encourage you all to take part in the discussion on this topic. Welcome, everybody. It's so great to see how many people found a way here today. We were afraid nobody, this is you know, <laughs> the 18th, you all partied yesterday and nobody was going to show up. So we're really happy that so many joined. And I hope you will all be active and ask questions, because now, now is the chance. We are going to discuss decentralized identity. And, I mean, that's a really hot topic. I guess when I say the word, a lot of people get different associations. What am I talking about? What is decentralized identity? And, I mean, is this just yet another EID? I mean, there's so many already. Do we need another one? And, I mean, that's what we're going to shed some light on and discuss. So this is also the time to, to ask your questions and try to understand this. So the way this works, uh, after my intro, the speakers are going to give a short presentation each on this topic, hopefully giving you some thoughts and ideas, maybe provoke you a little. And after that, we'll have an open discussion, everybody. So you can ask questions and we, we yeah, we discuss these topics and, and run into interesting things. Like I said, this will be recorded, so we're not going to publish the entire uh, thing, and it's mainly getting the speakers uh, on video. Um, yeah. I'd like to introduce the three speakers. We have, well, also I should say, um, I didn't even introduce myself. I'm John Eric Setsos. I work as VP of Identity and Innovation at Syndicap. But right now, I'm the representative of EMA. I'm also on the board of EMA. So I'm running this uh, EMA fireside briefing on behalf of EMA. So that, that's my role today, not Syndicap. <coughs> First, we have Mats Henriksven from Bypass. Uh, and he is the Trust Service Manager. I'm sure we're going to hear the word trust a lot. Jon Ernest is the tribe lead of sign and uh, trust. Again, yeah. trust. Yeah. <coughs> Tribes are really popular, so I mean, Singlecat has a tribe circle. And then we have Snorre Lothar von Goren Edwin, who is the co founder of Digital Identity Nordics and Divala. Um, Digital Identity Nordics was founded when? Two years ago. Two years ago. And we're spot on topic for that, because this is all about giving everybody their own identity and working on that in a Nordic context. So you should really pay attention to what's happening in the digital identity Nordics. OK, then, Mats, you want to kick off? Yes, I will. Uh, OK, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this topic with a perspective of a, uh, a uh, let me say, EID provider and a uh, QTSP, which, uh, which is the role bypass play today in this, uh, this system. So I'm going to talk about this <coughs> with respect to the uh, revised version of the uh, EIDAS uh, regulation, uh, call it EIDAS 2.0. And uh, could this be a legal framework for SSI? That's uh, that's my approach to this uh, to this topic. Uh, I'm sure you all know about the uh, EIDAS regulation, but this is an important regulation for uh, for actors like Bypass in uh, uh, in, uh, in Norway and in, in the EU in general. Uh, I'm not going to talk so much about this, but uh, but Bypass is a uh, <coughs> uh, EID provider in in Norway. It means that we are issuing EID means for Norwegian citizens in, the, uh, in, in Norway. 
Uh, we are also a uh, qualified trust service provider, meaning providing trust services uh, according to the uh, EIDAS uh, regulation. Trust services we are providing is typically issuing qualified certificates. So, so this is uh, this is the the, the background. Uh, I'm going <coughs> going to talk a uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, the relation, uh, the next generation of EIDAS regulation. But I would like to start with this. Uh, um, I, I found this uh, this uh, concept, which was introduced by Tim Boma, call it uh, less identity. I, I found this a little bit amusing. It's uh, it's focusing on legally enabled self-sovereign identity. This is also a kind of introduction. I, I think this is a good brief overview of uh, of the, the main characteristics of uh, self-sovereign identity in general. Uh, minimum disclosure, full control, necessary proofs. Uh, but my my uh, introduction will focus mostly on the last one. It's uh, legally enabled because uh, people have been working with self-sovereign identities for some years now, but now we see with the next generation of the EIDAS regulation that this might be the uh, the legal framework we uh, we, we could need in the in, uh, in the area of self-sovereign identity. So, we uh, uh, we got a new proposal in EIDAS revision last summer, uh, which uh, is uh, focusing on establishing a framework for a European digital identity. Uh, if we look into the, the details into this framework, uh, we uh, it's it's kind of easy to see that we find elements concepts which are at least typically inspired by self-sovereign identity. So I, uh, we, we, we see that we have this uh, concept of a wallet, we have a, uh, the attributes, credentials, we have issuers, credential issuers, credential providers. Um, and if we uh, compare these two, this is an example of a uh, SSI management model, we, we, we see a lot of um, elements which are Typically, uh, it's easy to see that this has been some kind of inspiration for the uh, EIDAS uh, uh, 2.0. Um, it's also important to understand that the uh, EIDAS uh, regulation, that's a, that's a legal framework. Uh, the SSI is uh, yeah, more technology. It's, it's more than a technology, but, uh, but uh, it's, uh, you must remember that these are two, two different to different areas they are they are addressing. So uh, with this new uh, EIDAS uh, um, 2.0, they also introduced the concept of a European digital identity wallet. Um, we see a definition um, below the illustration. So this is about uh, allowing the user to store data, identity data, credentials and attributes in, uh, in, in his wallet and uh, the wallet shall be under full control of the, of the user himself and it's up to the user to decide which attributes, which credentials are to be used for the different services uh, they are going to, to access. So this is, this is also uh, very similar to, to some of the elements we see in self-sovereign identity. Uh, the, the wallet it's uh, focusing both uh, on uh, natural persons and legal persons, but uh, I'm going to focus most on the on the, uh, the natural person side. So one uh, <coughs> one question I have been asking myself. I'm I'm not an expert, really an expert in uh, self sovereign identity. I know the concepts. I'm familiar with the concepts, but when we talk about uh, that the European Digital Identity Wallet shall be issued under a notified electronic identification scheme at uh, level of assurance high. I know what that means, <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to see how, how could this be linked into the self-sovereign identity terms and then the words of the self-sovereign identity. So let's see that if uh, the decentralized um, identif identifiers, the DITs, we know from self-sovereign identity. Uh, if we are going to use those under AIDAS 2.0, 
we need to link those decentralized identifiers uh, to the to the digital identity of the of the owner of the decentralized identity. So how do we accomplish this using the SSI technology? That's uh, kind of questions I, I have that we might uh, might discuss later. I also see in some examples on how to accomplish this, and this is very familiar from my point of view, which is coming from the uh, SSL QTSP issue of qualified certificates. Uh, we talk about uh, uh, the decentralized identifiers, that's something uh, your identity, which is it's you, your <laughs> responsibility to create this and, uh, and, and manage it. And if this is to be linked to uh, an identity uh, in the uh, EIDAS context, this could be accomplished by this instance. You could have the, uh, the decentralized identities are typically built around public key cryptography. So you have a public key and a private key. You could, for instance, you say uh, public key, which is certified in a qualified certificate as your private key for your decentralized identifiers and respectively for the private key. But this, this might also uh, raise some issues uh, related to the uh, privacy for, for using the uh, decentralized identifiers as, uh, as promised by the self-sovereign identity concept. Uh, in DAS uh, 2.0 we also have a new trust service which is called electronic attestation of attributes. Uh, this is also in a qualified variant. I talked about that bypass is an uh, issuer of qualified certificates, and this looks very similar, at least from my point of view. Uh, we could also issue qualified electronic attestations or attributes. And this is also very, <coughs> very similar to, to the verifiable credentials in, in SSI. So as you see, there are a lot of similarities between the concepts in uh, new ADAS regulation, the legal text, and the concepts in self sovereign identity. As a part of the, uh, the ADAS uh, 2.0, there is also a work going on in parallel with the legal, legal processes. It's about creating a toolbox, coming up with a uh, architecture and reference framework for, for standards, how to, how to implement this uh, regulation. And this is, uh, this is work in progress. Uh, they have identified a uh, set of uh, new roles in this new ecosystem, which is, uh, which is uh, defined in an outline, outline uh, implemented or written by an expert, expert group in, uh, uh, in the uh, EU. Uh, but we see there are a lot of similarities, as I said, between what the, uh, the, the concepts which is coming out from the uh, EADAS 2.0 and the concepts we know from the, uh, from the SSI. So, so uh, the question is, will EADAS 2.0 be able to, to bridge the gap in the, between these two worlds? The, the legal framework on the, on the one side and the SSI as a um, very interesting uh, identity concept on the other side. So uh, we, we could ask the questions in both, way, which, both ways. Will ADAS 2 be the legal framework for SSI? Or could we say that will SSI be able to uh, fulfill the requirements in the ADAS 2.0? That's also some interesting <laughs> discussions to be, uh, to be solved. Uh, <coughs> just uh, Few, uh, few uh, final words on the functionality in the wallet. This is also defined in this uh, this outline. Uh, I'm personally, I'm very focused on the cryptography or fascinated by the cryptography in these type of solutions. I've been working in this area for <laughs> 20 years. I know what's going also on in the long term when it comes to cryptography. Um, as the Cryptography and uh, cryptographic functions and keys are central in the ADAS 2.0 and also in the uh, uh, self-sovereign identity. I think this there are some interesting issues that needs to be solved in this area. Just uh, 
uh, listing of some uh, functionality which must be uh, must be handled in the in the uh, in the uh, digital identity wallet. But uh, just to summarize, I think the cryptography is co is core for both these uh, these uh, these two elements, both for the the ADAS regulation. Uh, we are talking about sole control, meaning that uh, we must ensure that it's only the the, uh, the owner of the uh, wallet who has uh, has control over the keys, which was used for different purposes. For instance, the electronic signature. We also have requirements on the EID means from that perspective that uh, the uh, the material should be uh, protected against attackers with high attack potential. It sounds quite difficult, but this is a part of the, the core requirements for the uh, cryptography in, in these type of solutions. And for SSI in general, uh, we know that the decentralized identifiers, they are also based on public key cryptography typically. Um, we also know that blockchain and distributed ledger technologies are also uh, also based on cryptographic primitives. So again, cryptography is a, is a very important part of this solution. So then the questions I, <coughs> I raise is, who is responsible for this cryptography? Uh, key management is typically, a, uh, could be an issue. Is, is this from based on requirements from the legal framework, uh, like EIDAS, or is it something for the wallet provider? Also talk about the user. The user has full control, right, in the self-sovereign identity, but could we expect that the user is able to manage all this cryptography and keys if, uh, in case the wallet is lost or stolen? Or is this something that the issuer of the credentials or the trust service provider should be responsible for. There's a lot of questions that I would like to raise and hope we are able to get some discussions on these topics. And finally, uh, what about post-quantum cryptography? If, if all the infrastructure we are creating today will be uh, a threat to being, uh, <laughs> let's say, broken in two, three, five, or some years, what will happen with all these solutions? That's an uh, introduction to uh, all right. topics I would like to uh, discuss okay. about. Okay, excellent. I, I, I like the, the part you talked about, less identity. Yeah. I haven't heard that list before. Minimum disclosure, self-control, necessary proofs, and legally uh, enabled. Yeah. And I guess that's core of what we're trying to achieve with this wallet. Yeah. Um, one question. Mm -hmm. um, you used the term SSI. Is everybody familiar? What is SSI? <laughs> right. You don't count. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think maybe, um, no, let, let's give an applause to... Uh, <laughs> so, maybe uh, hand over to uh, uh, Snorre, and maybe you could just start by saying two words, where does SSI come from? I mean, what, what's the background and rationale behind it? And I got some hand signals from back, please speak up. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Let's see if this works, right? Uh, yeah. So SSI stands for self-sovereign identity. Uh, it comes from, it's primarily a philosophy, but it's becoming a technological architecture, which we'll look into. Uh, who coined the term, I'm not sure, but Christopher, one of the um, TLS uh, authors, has been very eager on this in a very, very early stage, almost like seven years ago, and defining the eight principles of identity. We also have Kim Cameron, a uh, very important person who recently passed away, uh, who was an identity expert in Microsoft. He also wrote in 2007, uh, the seven rules of identity. Uh, so these people have been very important in talking about the philosophy of what should identity truly be. Uh, so that's a little backstory. Um, again, me, um, the co-founder CTO of Diwala, we are a product company delivering identity, decentralized identity to Africa. So that's why you don't hear much about us here in Norway. Uh, but we are also, uh, we are part of DIN, which is a member organization, where we try to discuss this complex, um, complex uh, topic of, of decentralized identity and the future of identity, now that you see that AIDAS is also coming in. Uh, 
Uh, I also sit and do interoperability discussions at the Centralized Identity Foundation, which is a global international standards body with a lot of American uh, companies, and I'll show you guys the list later. Um, so we all are aware of, well aware of this past, present, and future. Uh, we don't like to log in with Google, uh, we don't like to log in with Facebook, and we shouldn't like to log in with WIPs. Uh, it's not a big difference. Um, we should move to a place where we do have this less identity, so thanks for that uh, introduction, where we can not be dependent on a third party in every interaction we do online. And that, uh, to be able to do that, we need to do look at a decentralized model because federated with a lot of centralized nodes will, in the end, uh, have the problem we still keep having. So this is the present. Uh, the user on the left side don't have much control. The verifier here on the right side can be a website, it can be a IoT device, can be whatever. But today they have to go and ask for data from the third party. Um, it's not good. That means that the third party knows where you, what you're doing all over the internet and they are a bottleneck in the way that we can do uh, data exchange. So we want to get to this state right here where there's an issuer and you share the data with the verifier as you also showcase in different less humoristic uh, slides. Uh, but this is the future and we want to get there and how do we do that? Um, that's a discussion to, for today. Yeah, so basically that the user in the center, uh, the data is focused around them and not in silos where the connections go between all these back here, but it goes via the user. Uh, it's going to demand some thinking and some uh, core infrastructure to get in place. Uh, this is a high level picture. Um, SSI or decentralized identity have been split into four layers. Uh, and all these blue boxes are different attempts of technology, actually GitHub repos as well, who tries to solve these different layers. Uh, this is none of this code or this, these boxes are related to IDOS 2.0, so this is the international attempt. Because you have America, they're not part of IDOS 2.0, but they still want this. A national uh, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, has launched something called Silicon Valley Innovation Program, where they run a um, funded program with seven companies trying to solve a um, user journey of immigrating and living in the USA for 10 years and everything that person has to be a part of using this technology uh, and saying that we cannot end up in a situation where we buy software and lock ourselves to that vendor. We have to buy software where we need to solve the problem. We cannot buy Apple and say that they solve all our problems. We, we cannot buy Microsoft software and depend on that. We have to be able to buy both Apple and Microsoft and put it in the, in the different areas where the problem, problem area makes most sense. And that is uh, one of the directors has said that we cannot lock ourselves in anymore. We have to find a way that we can unlock ourselves but still be able to exchange data in a verifiable format. And these boxes will get us there. Um, and then a more <coughs> clear layered uh, view of this, where you have the, the blockchain I was talking about. <clears throat> and we can maybe touch upon more complex um, self-certifying identifiers, which doesn't use blockchain. Uh, it's more about um, using cryptography within an identifier to be able to just make sure that the signature makes sense. Um, you have the wallet we talked about, which is where the data lies and the connection is uh, exchanging. Um, and then you have the, the credential exchange, which is uh, where the data flows, where you never, this line here never flows data. It's the trust, is a trust by cryptography and potentially this legal framework that uh, is also important to have place. Uh, and this is, uh, trust over IP is a big foundation that trying to put more legal aspect on a global view. Uh, they're not involved in the EU as of this moment. Another picture, and we don't have to touch upon that. Um, and then Microsoft is very heavily involved in this. They were one of the core founders of Decentralized Identity Foundation. 
Uh, they have an implementation inside Microsoft Authenticator, if you ever want to try that out. Uh, but they, are, they have chosen one profile of the technology that exists today, which means that what we're making in Devala is currently not uh, interoperable with them. Uh, and all, a lot of other companies also is currently not interoperable with Microsoft because they are now trying to uh, bridge a gap between what they have today and moving forward. But they, um, they see the importance of this movement. One of the key uh, personnel of Microsoft, he left uh, recently and joined uh, Block, uh, the Twitter um, owner's new identity company uh, that does a lot of, they're gonna launch a blockchain exchange and they're also building the future of identity with a much more, less legacy. So he's there and building that. So there's a lot of stuff happening outside of EU as well. Um, but not with the same legal framework that the AIDAS pushes on uh, and also don't, there's no company or no countries being regulated from a EU perspective, which we can see done here in EU. <clears throat> this is a little subset of, of um, companies that has been involved. Um, on the left side here, like it's very difficult to see, but this is actually a long list of names. These are members of the Decentralized Identity Foundation. These are two German uh, consortias building, trying to build this. They're trying to also go, uh, uh, they're trying to uh, push AIDAS 2.0 um, <coughs> thoughts by going with the stack or that uh, stack we saw earlier and implementing it and say that's because we cannot just live on paper, someone has to go and put it into, into the hands of users and see how it works. So these consortia are doing that in Germany and they have fun, been really heavily funded um, and there's a lot of stuff happening just outside of EU as well. Yeah, so a couple of terminology that could, we'll probably uh, say during this talk is that you have public key infrastructure, um, you have this thing called decentralized public key infrastructure, which is really decentralized identifier on a blockchain. Uh, and then you have self-sovereign identity, a verifiable credential, and a decentralized identifier. It's easy to misinterpret DID as a decentralized identity, uh, it is not, uh, because identity is really just a combination of a identifier and pieces of data on top. Uh, so with, you can build an identity if you have a de an identifier that you can control and put a lot of verifiable credentials on top, and then you have to go and do the, all the complex part of making sure that that person who controls that identifier has the right to own that verifiable credential and also do that current exchange between uh, services and other wallets. I think that's that's it for me. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I like that past, present, future view. Where you know we are somewhere now between past and present. We have too many passwords that we manage. You know all these accounts. And then of course the big techs are taking over. You see so many places. You know login with Facebook, login with Google which means we are giving away a lot of information to these parties, both us but also the service providers. They don't really get the information they would like to get. So what we're trying to paint here is the picture of the future, <laughs> where we're putting the user back in control of what's sharing. Um, where we can have a gray button called login. <laughs> exactly, right. And then, of course, you touched on a lot of issues. And, of course, one of the slides, there's a lot of cooks in here. Mm. And there could be a lot of mess. With many cooks, so that's one of the challenges that we are working on. You know how to, to organize this. But I'll let uh, Jon give some uh, intro here. So, yeah, um, maybe title could be a bit provocative, but never mind. It's I'm not saying it's gonna be a failure. It's just saying it's not carved in stone that because the EU Commission says we'll get an identity wallet that we'll get a successful system and the successful deployment in Europe and uh, this is more about the risks what could possibly go wrong in this process right. and uh, touching upon some of uh, topics some of these are 
general to distributed identity systems. Some of these risks, some of them are inherent just to the to the wallet. Do you want to say something? No, just to comment. I mean, we've used the term digital wallet a number of times. I think all of you have used it, including myself. Is it clear what a digital wallet is? Necessarily, but it's the um, I would say define it as the technology that enables me, to, my interface to my uh, self-sovereign identity, you could say. Mm. This is what where I where I where I have sort of a dashboard and I control it. It could be an app on my mobile phone. It could be also other other technology. So yeah. you might have another definition. Yeah, like there's been talks the last mm. years about digital assistant, mm. uh, your twin online. Mm all these kind of concepts and a wallet is really that it's just a place that you have a piece of software it can live on an app in your phone it can live as an agent in the cloud you can live under signicot if they define the, the someone yeah. decided to d deliver that service mm -hmm. and you just have a ui to control it uh, but it's a it's a place where you can basically control data and exchange data and see it and also have much more mm. you can also probably I'm just thinking in the future, put in like Zapier, uh, like automation on top of your wallet so that you can automatically reply to requests for something, right? So it's really all those three concepts, digital assistant, digital twin, and a the wallet, they kind of go all together, but a wallet has been the easiest way to tell the story. Yeah, yeah. so um, you could argue is wallet a good term, maybe an agent something would be a better term for what you're trying to do, but it's and it also causes uh, confusion. Uh, ADAS 2.0 does not mention payments. Uh, when you get to the running pilots on this EU wallet, payments suddenly occurred. Uh, someone thought, hey, you can't have a wallet without payment. There's something like that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, let's see. We went through this, but actually to a, a partly a recap and partly something new here that um, the EU wallet is a level high EID. That's a starting point. So that it shall have same functionality as the bypass ID or a bank ID to provide your real official identity in an authentication process. That's one thing it shall do. Uh, issued based on national identity documents procedure and uh, in addition to the official identity, it shall provide you with attributes and attestation. That could be in addition to your official identity, linked to that identity, or it could be instead of. Um, enabling use of qualified signatures and full user control or release of information. They call it sometimes, the EU doesn't use the term self-sovereign identity, but they sometimes call it self-sovereign identity inspired. So, uh, yeah. Um, quite important stuff here is that um, uh, many of us still want, uh, I think unfortunately the, that battle is lost, but um, still arguing that this should have been a qualified trust service. Meaning this could have been a commercial service offered in the internal market and if you're approved and supervised and audited and everything in one country you could provide it across the EU that did not happen. What's the case now is that this is something that's issued by government, on behalf of government, or in the same model as we used in the EID market in, uh, in Norway and in Nordics by some private actors that are approved by government. But it limits severely uh, the, uh, the business case for the private sector in this, uh, in this setup. <coughs> uh, what ADAS has ADAS 2.0, which is still a draft, which is why I also state this stuff about still lobbying and arguing that this could be a qualified trust service. Uh, it's not carved in stone, it's a draft, and it's work in progress. And maybe it will go until uh, beginning of 2023 before we have uh, an approved version of ADAS 2.0. And the same goes for the wallet and the work of the wallet. This is the work in progress, it's something we can influence. But um, according to the current draft ADAS, there are lots of private service providers that uh, must accept the wallet, and also including uh, very large online platforms like uh, the big techs for the Digital Services Act. Um, 
there is a call out now for large scale pilots and uh, yeah they're serious about this uh, is the comment because they launched the idea of a wallet and then they made a call where the EU Commission puts 37 million euros in out for grab. And that's a 50% contribution, so it means 74 million euro is the real size of these pilots. Could be four pilots, at least four. And uh, yeah, there's a call ongoing until now, middle of August. Um, so it needs. Um, wallet responsible agencies as actors to supply so Norway might actually be heading one uh, one application Sweden has another one there are some but there are leaks between them but this happens right what has been the immediate effect of this wallet initiative uh, enormous increase in interest in SSI distributed identity wallet based systems uh, it's not just that this is an entirely new concept and nothing exists out there or only experimental stuff. Um, Irma is a Dutch example of a working real life system operational. Uh, maybe limited in functionality, but it's quite good actually. It's a good starting point. But also, yeah, given these 37 million euros, will the EU wallet happen? Yes, it will. Uh, will it be a success? We don't know. Will it be the only one around? Definitely no. There will be uh, other systems as well. So, what are the risks that could kill this? All that needs to be considered in the process, to put it in a more diplomatic way, right? <laughs> um, that was a bit touched upon, but uh, maybe the main risk is that you have an ecosystem where there are, is no clear business model for the actors one or more of them. Uh, you can have systems that you design that technically work perfect, everything is, yeah, does its job, and then you try to deploy them in real life, like in the European society, and it fails, because uh, no one wants to take that particular role. There's no way to earn money on it. Uh, you could, of course, design something that depends on government funding. That's also a business model. This is not specific to SSI, but um, some of the self-sovereign identity, decentralized identity concepts make it more difficult to get payment done. That's, that's a fact. It's not unsolvable, it's just you have to consider it from the beginning. So as an example, attribute provisioning with a wallet. We got sources, we got this qualified attribute attestation provider over there delivers the attributes to the wallet, and the user delivers this on to a relying party. And the attribute as the station provider shall not know who the relying party is, the user shall not pay, uh, the relying party will be interested in paying of course, but uh, that's not clear because if I as an attribute as the station provider certain suddenly starts receiving payment from someone, I get more information than I should have. And again, it's not unsolvable, it just shows uh, the challenge in, uh, in getting this in place. Lack of interoperability with other UIDs? Well, for sure there's a lot of attention on interoperability of different SSI schemes. That's not uh, like that, but sometimes you see, it seems like the Commission believes that uh, the EU wallet will be the only EID around which is not the case because you have one extreme where this is something that is there but hardly used middle situation which will be the case in the long in the shorter term at least it's one of several but you could have the extreme situation that this is the only one uh, likely not um, there's also a notion successful deployments so far have been uh, public private cooperation refer to the model where um, government is the issuer that this one alternative for the EU wallet. That's actually one of them. Another risk, lack of buy-in from the member states. Fact is, no member states asked for this. This is from the Commission. And it came as a surprise actually to many member states. Finland had a process launching a call to implement their own wallet, the Finnish wallet. And then, hey, what's this? 
we need to align, we need to make sure what we have eventually make in Finland uh, fits with what the EU is proposing now. So there is a risk that some member states, yeah, we are obliged to offer it, so we do, but there's not much apart from being available. Or well, they don't manage to get deployment. Uh, states and sales and marketing is not a good combination. Like a buy-in from commercial actors. This was touched upon already, since the wallet is issued the way it is. Commercial wallet issuers will have a role primarily in uh, Model C, where it's private actors issuing the wallet and they are approved by a government. But they need approval in each and every member state where they want to offer the service. It's not like you can get the point approval in one country and uh, deploy it all over Europe. Um, and also stated some commercial reliant parties are obliged to accept the wallet, but there is clear risk. Commercial issues stay out of this case, may even launch competing solutions. And these commercial relying parties, ah yeah, we accept it, surely, but we don't encourage anyone to use it. We rather rely on other EOD solutions. Lack of trust in society? Yeah, there's all, <laughs> even being some uh, demo, what's called in English, not demonstrations, that's something else, but you, you, you march in the streets, right? Yeah. Protests. See, protests, yeah, we don't want this wallet. It's a uh, threat to our privacy instead of the opposite because uh, it's controlled by the government. And there's one article out there on Orwell's wallet, which <laughs> I think is, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm recommending that one, but anyway, um, there is a risk, of course, is if you manage to spur uh, opposition in society against it. And there's another one. This we know quite well in Norway from uh, early discussions on the possibility of a government-issued EID on the national identity card, and uh, we know exactly what um, problems we faced. Uh, if this is introduced in a mature market and it's mandatory that it's going to be available also for commercial sector, and it's not only for government, it means that uh, it goes into a competition. If this is a new solution besides bypass and bank ID, for example, it's a competing solution. So uh, rules on fair competition and government subsidies come into play. Definitely. So this could make it difficult. I don't think they've given this sufficient thought, actually. Complexity, technological immaturity. Um, sort of touched upon it in the previous one. There are different initiatives, many of them. And although interoperability is being um, targeted, uh, it's clear that there's some kind of standardization effort needed. Will this work? I think one year after revised ADAS, this is supposed to be in place. That could mean early 2024. That's too optimistic. Uh, but of course, there is a risk that it's too complex to work at all. So what's the problem? Is there a lack of standards or too many of them? Maybe both. Um, at EU level, only these official uh, standards bodies are formally recognized. They're the only one to deliver European norms, if you want it that way. But on the other hand, there are lots of different organizations providing specifications, but uh, we try to count, and there might be like six to seven different ways of mediating attributes to a wallet according to one or other, call them standards, or at least open specifications. If you have a wallet, you need to narrow it down. You cannot provide six to seven different ways. Maybe you can accommodate two, three. Something needs to be done. So this pretty immature still in this area. Uh, what they will do is to make a reference implementation. It could be another kind of a risk. Um, Q3 this year, after summer, there will be a call, it's planned a call at least, to, uh, for someone to do a reference implementation. And some rumors are, or some arguments are that this will be uh, a mandatory component for the pilots and maybe even for wallet deployment. 
So this means uh, if this happens, uh, you might say you could short circuit the entire um, standardization process. You will just, for that call, select some options and that will be what is used. Which is not a good process, but uh, it of course takes less time than doing the standardization properly. That's it. Uh, lots of open issues. Um, it is work in progress and it's uh, possible to influence what goes on. Mm. Right. Mm. Thank you. I mean, you also mentioned trust several times. And oh, yeah. yeah and, and it's all a trust issue. I mean, I mean we, we are in the lucky situation that we in general trust the government, right? But what if you're in a situation where you don't trust the government and the government issues a wallet? Will you as an individual trust that wallet that they don't trace you, etc.? Um, but I'd like to kick off with one question. The EU is throwing a lot of money on this. Mm. They have a really ambitious time frame. Mm. Why? I think there is a, so I want to answer that, there is a general conclusion that uh, current ADAS regulation, ADAS version 1, the EID part is a failure. Mm. Did not work. And uh, the main reason it didn't work is likely there's no deployment of electronic identity in so many member states. Uh, half of them, uh, more than half of them, do not have uh, any working EID system. And it's getting more and more realized that this is a core component for digitalization. You can't do it without a proper identity system. So if you want to do something about that, uh, you do something like the wallet. You say, this is the modern way of thinking about identity, and we need to get this deployed in all member states. So that's some, somewhat what I reckon, uh, reckon as the starting point in this case. Any comments on why EU is in such a hurry on this? I, I support that the universal one has been a failure in the yeah. SMC deployments. I think there's someone there that wants to get something new working, and mm. then there has been a very long drive for SSI, and they were able to pick that up and understand it. So, mm. Mm. Yeah, I agree, and also that uh, in ADAS 1.0, it was a focus on the public sector needs, exactly. and uh, I think uh, including private sector, is, uh, I think it's a bit... Uh, right, but at least, yeah. I mean, the ADAS 2 is including the, yeah. the private yeah. sector as well. Yeah. And would part of it also be the fear that the big techs will take this wallet space? Yeah, that's almost openly stated. So it's part of it. Yeah. The Digital Services Act and the Digital Platform. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. those two acts are more important, but it's part of the same. Yeah. Right. Is, he, is he already Apple is um, has been purchased by Wyoming or not Wyoming, a couple of states in the U.S. Yeah. They're doing the MDL uh, exactly. mobile driver's license spec, which is another <coughs> data model spec, really. Uh, mm. So which is another standard that trying to then get this foothold to do this exchange of data in a, in a straight line. Is that yeah. I think in what, nine different states in the US now you can add your driver license to the Apple wall? MasterCard runs identity programs in Africa. <coughs> yeah. International exactly. ID cards. Right. Mm. Okay, so what's happening in your brains now? Is this all confusion? Does anything make sense? What questions do you have? Mm. Yes, please. Sure. So uh, there was a really interesting statement in the last presentation, a couple of slides back. Uh, it says uh, the EU only recognizes uh, uh, five or six standards bodies. Mm. And there was a really missing one there, uh, which is probably the most important one, is IETF, the Inge Internet Engineering Task Force. They're not, uh, and not mm. recognized by you, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and the big discussion in the US uh, is Web3, uh, which obviously in engineering task force will have a word about and you know people like Jack Dorsey from Twitter um, producer from Twitter Elon Musk uh, uh, Mark Andreessen from venture capital talking about web three all the time being a public blockchain based mm. type of new infrastructure <coughs> where the big rage is whether it's going to be uh, uh, Bitcoin based and uh, building on the Bitcoin blockchain with some of the gold uh, lightning network which is built on top of that again or some other like Ether or someone but I think you know it's 
looks like it's going that way. Uh, that uh, the Web three will have will be some sort of public blockchain based, uh, and you're getting right into decentralized identities. Um, you already have a wallet there that's working, that's robust, uh, and you can store money, so you can probably store identities. So I think you know. It, I, I can't really see this. I, I remember from voice IP days, uh, ITU tried to define the voice IP standard called H323, and they were completely trumped by uh, IETF with the SIP standard. Um, and I see something very similar happening here. I can't really see how EU is going to be able to do this without the support of IETF and whatever's going on with uh, Web3, where we actually have a public, uh, it's not a commercial, it's a public blockchain or public. Uh, from, from this or that angle. So, do you have any comments to that? Do you agree? What, what do you think? Yep. Um, partly, one way to get around it is by indirectly using standards from IETF or, uh, or other such bodies. Mm -hmm. And that's been done by Etsy and SEND, European Standards Bodies, make, basing, yeah. making such references uh, uh, mandatory in, in standards. That's a way of getting around it. But. Um, not recognizing IETF is a bit weird. Uh, I tend to agree with you uh, on that topic. Basing on blockchain uh, or distributed ledger, um, it's likely something is going to happen here. But I mentioned several ways of exchanging attributes. Some of them are based on blockchains, others are not. So it's not a mandatory component. And this architectural reference framework uh, that Mots uh, referred to is still quite open. It doesn't mention the ledger. It can be used. Then it's pretty clear that if it is to be based on the ledger technology, it's likely not the cryptocurrency ledgers. Uh, there is a clear risk uh, exemplified if um, Bitcoin collapses, the Bitcoin blockchain will disappear. So it's a it's a clear risk. You can't really do that. But there is uh, a European blockchain services infrastructure trying to build um, a more neutral uh, way of structuring that. And that's clear. That's a promising initiative, actually, using the same technology. So it's a matter of um, using blockchain or some distributed ledger technology without relying too much on the, on the cryptocurrencies. I mean, you need, you need an SMA. You need somebody responsible when there are problems, etc. So you can. You know, that's why you can. Yeah, you can, but there is you can yeah, you can build it on ether, for example. But there right. there is a risk there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. well, that reminds me. When mm -hmm. Digital equipment once said, you know, if the internet goes down, how do you uh, who support you call? So it's a bit similar. A, a public blockchain cannot disappear, right? It's in the public domain. It, the value of Bitcoin can go to zero, but yeah, the but the blockchain I mean, what happens to the Bitcoin blockchain if the value of Bitcoin goes to zero and there is no initiative for those keeping the yeah. nodes? Up. Um, if, if it's the basis of Web three, and uh, they won't disappear, right? It's yeah, if they have all, if they have all the sources, right. other sources of income, to put it that way, because the actors yes, need an income to to get the blockchain going. Mm -hmm. Is uh, is IOTA one of those more neutral? It could be one of them. Yeah. Mm. So you, you just to kind of mm -hmm. highlight a couple of blockchain initiatives, you have mm -hmm. Sovereign, which is again the self blockchain just for identity. You have Checked. Uh, and also you have Microsoft's attempt, which did set a layer two level on top of Bitcoin, <coughs> which is called SideTree, uh, to, to avoid all the transaction problem. But again, if if the Bitcoin price goes down and there is, as I say, no incentive to keep the trust up, then what mm. is going to... Of course, the government can take over the network because the data and chains are there and then just start running it. But I don't think we will have one Bitcoin to rule them all, <coughs> or not Bitcoin, blockchain. <laughs> Uh, so, we have to figure out, the, the did spec ad abstracts the blockchain uh, view of it. It says, I can take whatever as long as you understand the did spec, as long as you know how to resolve this did, then you can use whatever blockchain you want. So the blockchain is in this, in the decentralized identity space, is actually just one piece of puzzle. It was layer four, the, anch the anchor, but it's not where the data goes. It's Primarily, just where your your decentralized public key infrastructure goes. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a very <coughs> fine balance to figure out how to utilize that without overutilizing it and exposing too much data on the blockchain. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's also easy to, or it's uh, important to, to remember that this uh, legal framework, it's, uh, it's a kind of the, uh, the way that the EU Commission wants to be able to, to manage all these initiatives which is going around all, the, all over mm -hmm. the world, right? So, uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's not easy right now to see uh, how this will be implemented in Europe. But of course, if it's possible to use some of the technology, some of the standards, uh, I guess that uh, there will be a choose, but not necessarily one, one standard or mm. one specification for, for, a, for, a, for a problem. Mm. So uh, hopefully layered, as you say, sort yeah, of. Yeah, that yeah. it's not it's not like everything depends on everything, but that you can change components. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and internet works today. Everyone has seen the hourglass model, where it all intersects on IP. Mm. Um, there has been attempts to kind of figure out what does that instead of have one hourglass, you have two hourglasses, where you can have a broad intersection on one piece that we agree on in the identity space. Like if that's what that piece is, is unclear. We have to have one intersection where everyone can be like, okay, there we agree, and then we can go broader again uh, with different <coughs> exchange specifications, data model specifications, and other blockchain specifications. So uh, there, there's been work on one, one agreement on one on the intersection. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. One on the back there. <coughs> right. Uh, the question for Snorri primarily, but also I would like to hear the other opinions. So if I understood correctly, you are focusing on Africa, and like, so what makes it easier to go to Africa and what makes it more complicated to tackle the EU or the Western world? Yeah, it's, it's easier because there's less legacy. They're prone to be able to leapfrog to the next step. Uh, they don't, like in EU we have done, or at least Nora, we have done 15 years of technology that is intertwined into society and how do you just switch that out? cannot you have to bridge in Africa you don't have that technology intertwined a lot of European countries also don't have all that good technology so they can leapfrog faster but specifically in Africa you can move even even faster uh, because it's decentralized identity is not dependent primarily on uh, on one database uh, it depends on what trust framework you set up if you agree that that issue over there has some solid data ground to say that you are you or that company is a company, you can start from that perspective uh, and work out from there and build it with an exchange policy that we currently work out. So it's a little bit more freedom. Um, uh, the only, that, but that can be a problem in the case that they don't demand too much. Coming in uh, Norway and EU, they demand okay specifications, follow these uh, cryptographic laws and everything, and there they just want solutions that work better. Right. So, uh, and we have a functional system, so why change it, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's sort of the problem in Norway. <coughs> yes. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, from the Nets Auto First Services. Yeah. Uh, if you are here in five. Six, eight years, and this has actually been a huge success. What has then been the key success factors in tech? Is it commercial terms, adopting private sector? Is it legal? Is it user experience? What is the key success factors? All of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if you select one, <coughs> that's what you're challenging, right? Yeah, What's yeah, the top yeah, one? Because I, I said uh, some. Uh, you question that this actually will be a success, and mm. we, for good reasons. I, I'm, uh, I'm not um, uh, questioning that, uh, but uh, if it will be a success, what, what do we need to, to or what uh, does EU need to succeed? Uh, go first, or yeah, I, I, I think maybe the intersection <coughs> between legal and technology. Because you need the legal framework, at least in Europe, you need the, the legal framework that's stating this is the way to do it. And then you need um, uh, technology that's appealing to the users and that works as intended. So the users will pick it up and that this is then again pushed uh, as the way of doing it. I think that's, that's the way because uh, there's this at the bottom here, there is also this fight against the big tech, right? Those actors that try to gather as much information about you as possible 
and profile you and sell sell your uh, personality to uh, commercial <coughs> actors, mm. and uh, that's that's one of one of those things at the bottom that you want to fight uh, with this in this, these initiatives. I think Mats wants to disagree. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, like okay. that's okay. That's <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I think that we uh, more or less have the uh, have the legal requirements at least mm. as a proposal. Um, as you, you more or less also have the technology. It's, it's a lot of lot of technology to, to pick from. I think mm. uh, in in this area. But I, I think also it it's, uh, needs some kind of maturity, both for both for the users uh, and at least for service providers. In order to, to get this uh, success, we need to have a lot of services which users are interested in using the wallet to access, right? So so uh, so that's I think I think that might be uh, the, the main challenge to to to, uh, to challenge all the service providers out there. What is in this for you? What, how, how can you how can you use this uh, uh, excellent infrastructure or ecosystem? If if we are able to realize it, I think that's the that's the key question. Do you want to disagree too? No, I, I, <laughs> I would say that I always like the power of stories. So if we're able to get some successful stories out there, that proves that moving in a straight line of data exchange gives us value, gives us possibilities for uh, faster innovation, gives us a lot of new possibilities, creating smaller trust communities instead of having this one global big thing, then we will be able to kind of move even faster. And I think we're starting to see those stories, but they're not populating the, the common common communication yet. Uh, it's, it's very, like, up in here because it happens in a small close community, not close, it's a very open community, but you can't go and participate in all communities that there is. So I think more more storytelling basically of those successful uh, attempts that has been actually implemented is really, really important. Yeah. I think I think there's one piece of uh, legal work missing though, um, yet at least, and that's the control of the relying parties, those receiving the information, but there's, there's no nothing there yet that will keep someone from asking me for all my information. Yeah, yeah, right. And if I get something in return, many users may or might be uh, vulnerable to actually giving away much too, far too much information. Yeah, so that's, exactly. that's also part of it, so the balance that the user is really in control and uh, the service providers don't get more than they, uh, they're not allowed to ask for more than they need. Mm. Which is a complex one and all, mm. and and you know I, I agree with all you said. I, mm. I would also again highlight the user buying. I mean, mm. you mentioned trust yeah. already, unless you get the user buying on trust, well, it's going to fall apart. And also, I mean, there was a report released in Norway earlier this year that said only about fifty percent of people were comfortable setting up two-factor authentication. And now we're going to throw this concept out there with the digital wallet and everything. You know, we need to make it really simple to use for to get the user buying. So I mean, it's difficult to point out one. I mean, all of these aspects needs to, to be in place. And it's not sufficient. It's not a l sufficient on its own nope. because you still have your device. If you use your mobile device as you're linked towards the digital world mm. and uh, through that mobile device, all your information will pass, exactly. more or less. So if that mobile device uh, or the apps on that device uh, are not trustworthy, so uh, there was a this another report by uh, Forbrukerrådet in Norway about how apps leak information oh, yeah. to different uh, sources. That will also be part That's of the game, trying to stop that kind of behavior in addition to the control of your own personal information. Exactly. I think that. Okay, we have. Uh, <laughs> let's move on. That's another question. Yeah, that's actually uh, goes up on, on top of what I'm uh, asking, Jon. Uh, um, privacy. Mm. Like decentralized identity, wallets, and especially ledger technology, and like privacy and the right to be forgotten. Mm. Any comments uh, for that? It's very high focused. Mm. Uh, it's important to remember that this is not being solved by putting data on the blockchain. Mm. Uh, you're trying to avoid putting everything, any PII or personal identifiable information on your blockchain. 
Uh, and also, as you said in your list, uh, uh, selective disclosure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be a difficult UX challenge to kind of get people to accept it, but that is all about that mm -hmm. one story that, hey, I go to a bar and I, <coughs> to be accepted in or to be able to buy a beer, you scan a QR code and it just says above 18. It doesn't say your name, your whole birth or date, your in the US, you even got where you are born, a state issue and everything. It doesn't give that information to the guy who's just going to sell you a beer. Uh, it just says above 18, and it's a way to trust it because the cryptography and the data model and everything just works. So it, for me, it's super strange that now we have a driver's license app. I cannot use it to say I'm above 18 at the Vinmopole. Why not? Um, so, how far have we really gotten? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as you point out, uh, Jung, uh, there's a lot of obstacles for this EU initiative, so obstacles that it has to get past uh, to be uh, successful. So, my question is kind of to, to all the other. Uh, panelists as well as you uh, about how optimistic are you that this project will succeed and if it fails what will happen instead what do you think is the likely scenario then mm -hmm. Should we start with the last one what's the dark scenario no I, I don't think it's a, necessarily a dark scenario I think uh, one of my first slides said that what is what does be the immediate effector it's the focus on this type of technology and this type of thinking, more this type of thinking more than technology actually. But this is the way forward in identity. I think that will happen even if uh, the EU wallet initiative specifically fails. The same thing will happen, but you will see other actors coming up with uh, other types of solutions, maybe the same functionality, maybe something different. So I'm not that worried. I think. Uh, Five to eight years from now, as someone asked, um, we we're sitting here. I think we'll uh, we we'll be looking back and say that this is the starting point. This is where when it starts really getting uh, getting an accepted and uh, a mainstream way of thinking. I think that will continue. I think the dark scenario is just add five to ten years on top of the timeline. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. it's come it's coming. Uh, mm -hmm. It just depends on. And, and government regulations can push things forward faster. Uh, but if that project fails, then it just takes a bit longer. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I agree. I, I'm, I'm kind of optimistic in a way, uh, because I think, uh, I think the technology, uh, the concepts uh, is, is there. And I think it's a very big eager in the EU Commission, in the EU, EU area, to, to, to solve this. And, uh, and in fact, we, we have, there has been done some good work already in, in this area. Okay. Since 2016 and up to now, we have at least a lot of trust services, which is uh, actually working quite well, uh, mm. from my understanding. Now they are trying to do the same uh, in the EID area. I think it's a good approach. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little bit optimistic. Mm -hmm. right. And of course, every time there's news about a new data leak, yet another data leak, well, that's another incentive yeah, yeah, to yeah, continue yeah, to work yeah, on this. Yeah. But to, to add to that question about privacy, to me, it's you have to think a bit bigger than mainly privacy uh, in this case. Identity is more a societal thing. It's, it's psychology, it's all kinds of aspects on all the information out there that can be linked back to me. And privacy is just a legal term, so it's more narrow, it's uh, your right to protect your own information. But uh, you have to think about just the legal concept of privacy to, um, to get the, this, the concept uh, running, I think. And then of course the goal needs to be sufficiently secure uh, with all the mechanisms and all systems. Yeah, I, I would like just to add that uh, I think uh, Snorja mentioned all about this. Uh, this uh, we, we have the technology; it's possible to solve it, but uh, but we might uh, we, we need to design uh, design privacy into the solutions, right? Mm -hmm. So we have the legal requirements, and in order to take the technology and implement it in a correct way, we need to design these features into the into the into the solution. Then. 
I've my biggest worry is still the, the issue of the business models. Yeah. Because if you want to implement it in real life, there must be real actors getting taking real liability, money. getting getting paid for what exactly. they're doing actually, for running the systems, for taking liability and uh, for providing information. Yeah, we, we like this comment on the business model that we see today there is this ad hoc business model happening in, in Africa specifically where uh, issuing party issues a piece of paper, signs it with normal signatures and goes by via other places to sign it, the piece of paper. <clears throat> goes to the holder, the owner of the piece of paper, that goes to the verifier and what happens is that the verifier never trusts the piece of paper, of course. Uh, they take that and <coughs> pays $10 to get a copy of that piece of paper from the issuer uh, to be able to say, ah, they look the same. Uh, and then they can move on with, with that person. Uh, so, there we are looking upon as as a software company trying to split that model with the issuers. So every time, the, because the the, the the paying force here is on the verifiers. They want to make make sure that they actually trust what they're seeing. Um, they are paying uh, how much is it for bank ID now? A kroner per login or something more? More? more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And if you can make that into a, 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 a split scenario where the verifier is the ones that pays, and they can go to the back to the issuing party uh, in the end, as you also mentioned a little bit about. But as you mm. say, it's going to be difficult to see where the money mm. comes. But it's it's something we're exploring in Africa because we see that that model is clearly in place. As you can understand, we are the in which we enjoy discussing these topics, and we do talk a lot about it, and there's a lot of challenges. So. Erik, yes. uh, mm -hmm. so I have a bit of a different view and we'll pull it more into payment. Mm -hmm. Because as you might know, uh, Norway is actually leading the pack mm -hmm. when it comes to digital wallets and payments. Uh, we're also quite far ahead when it comes to PSD2, uh, open banking, that kind of scenarios. Uh, also with our domestic schemes, with international schemes, stuff like that. Uh, however, PCT is also a kind of a failed EU regulation, uh, which we're supposed to give everyone should have open to, uh, access to all interfaces with all banks, mm. uh, which they kind of failed to do too well. And they also forgot the whole customer side. You know, how can we have a standardized way of identifying the customers with distributed the CA on bring your own device? <coughs> so uh, now they are starting up with the PC truth. No, PSD3, sorry. Mm. Uh, is there any way that you see that IDAS, together with PSD3, uh, PSD3, can solve the kind of scenarios where you can have a bring your own device scenario in the shop, in an offline scenario, and do authentication for a payment? Mm. Uh, if, have you ever used MetaMask, like, to have done a crypto or cryptocurrency exchange? Uh, because then, basically, what that is uh, is that uh, uh, I should add with the existing payment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's, it's, it's just you got to take it back to first principles. Yeah. And what it is, it's just getting uh, truth, like a, basically a signature from the person who is in the controller of that amount of money, mm. and say that can pass it on to the system, and that thing can go through the systems and be processed where the where it needs to be processed. Um, and I've been thinking about that. If you have a wallet and you have a cryptographic set of keys, you can always provide that signature. And we can actually go back to digital, fast, efficient checks. Because that is what really payment is, is it's checks and balances. And so if I can deliver a quick signature of a certain payment and send it on, and it cannot be compromised, it cannot be changed, because if it's changed, the signature is compromised, and that can flow through the system of payment, we you're able to do payment. Mm -hmm. uh, and now with all MasterCard's attempts as providing um, uh, cards at tokens, <coughs> like you have those virtual cards, mm -hmm. they're really just tokens. What are they really? They're just JWT tokens in the end because they're cryptographically verifiable and can flow through the system. So I think it's very feasible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just um, it's possible. In, very difficult to do everything at once, uh, but once you have that infrastructure of a person has cryptographic keys and data can flow, I think payment is just the next step. In. Yeah. 
Well, I think, yeah, combining stuff from the ADAS legislation into what they do in payments is surely feasible. I think they recognize that they did a mistake mm -hmm. in the first run. Like, PSD2 strong customer authentication is something to find on the side of ADAS, mm -hmm. which is clearly wrong because you already have an identity <coughs> concept and assurance levels of identity. So, why define uh, a completely new concept just for payments? And if you look at Strax <laughs> Tallinn, it's really blockchain because they, it's a network of nodes from all the device, different uh, mm. banks that has come together to exchange data. Mm. And that's blockchain, it's nodes communicating with together, keeping the truth up to sync. Yes, yeah. do you have another question? Sure, um, yes, yeah, so a problem with the digital wallets is pretty well known, they have long keys, right? Mm. And they're hard to remember, so, uh, so people lose them. <laughs> and then if you lose your key to your identity wallet, you kind of lose your identity, I guess. <laughs> um, so, and in order to solve that, sometimes you have hosting providers that host your wallet, or, but then you gotta get access to that, your wallet from some other ID, <laughs> whether it's two-factor or whatnot. So, but that's got a different ID to log on to get to. You might end up with Google or Facebook or Microsoft logins to get to your mm -hmm. wallet, right? It's a pretty difficult problem, I think. Uh, do you have any, is there any, any sort of good solution for this? Uh, like, uh, what do you do if, if when people lose their keys uh, for an for, uh, identity wallet? You guys go first. I'm also <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think this is uh, mm -hmm. the main challenge, as I will introduce in my yeah. presentation. And, uh, of course, when it comes to, uh, also to the uh, EIDAS uh, requirements, there are quite strict requirements when it comes to protecting private keys. Might also be an issue with, you mentioned, uh, bring your own device. Uh, but what type of device are you bringing? Uh, we also know that it's uh, pretty sure that these uh, this, uh, EU digital identity wallets there will be some requirements on the certification for those. So I, I think those high level or very high strong requirements on that type of solution will, will affect the, uh, the, the easiness you are looking for in the <laughs> from, from the user point of view. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult balance um, because uh, we, we need to ensure that uh, those, those keys we are talking about giving access to this, uh, this type of services, they should not be floating around, <laughs> right? But, but uh, I'm quite sure they will be uh, come up with uh, solutions yeah. uh, on this, but uh, even they might be difficult right now. Yeah, in the, in the EU wallet proposal, there is this concept of a wallet provider, which is a service provider. And we don't really know, neither getting back to the business model again, but also the functionality needs to be provided. Um, I, assume that one functionality that the wallet provider will have is to provide a recovery function for users. Yeah. But of course, whenever there is a recovery function, there's also a risk. Yeah, so there's a trade-off as Mott says. Yeah. 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 Uh, one user journey uh, I always talk about in this context is the Shamir secret sharing, uh, where you're basically able to split up the keys, put it into mm -hmm. different uh, trusted entities, and. I lose my device, I get a new device, I download the, the, um, uh, the wallet again, and I basically go and say, hey, I, I kept my one part in Facebook, one part in Twitter, and the other part in my bank. And then there's a, there's, a, there's a way of not logging in without that high level of insurance which the wallet can give, uh, but then you get back to the problem of, okay, then there's, if you can, if you're allowed to log in with a lower level, you can breach that uh, at some point. But if you then split it out to these three parties, you distribute the the issue, and it might be a, f a viable solution. Um, but um, there are the ma the maths, the technology in the sense is there to be able to do it. Uh, and then it's just about how do we uh, experience it as users. I mean that, that's one. I mean, account recovery is definitely one of those uses things that you should expect. Mm -hmm. Same as you know, it doesn't work. Who do I call? Yeah. I, I mean, we have some statistics saying that twenty percent of all Bitcoin are lost. Yeah. 
because users can't get access to it. And some guy yeah. had a landfill dug up to find yeah. an old PC yeah. disk. Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> no, it's a very important question. Yes, anybody? Well, first of all, I react to the concept of uh, decentralized when you present it. It's like uh, it could be anywhere, you know, and uh, I can understand users get completely freaked out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I compare this to the passport history, you know. You started with passport, you managed to have uh, like a organization, you managed to standardize the passport, or you even managed to make a European passport for those who are in Europe, because we talk about Europe. And okay, at the end of the day, uh, this is uh, fixed by the police, you know, by the government. And here I feel what is very challenging is that on one side you want not to depend anymore on the governmental <coughs> most trusted you know, uh, provider. And in the same time, you have the, the barrier of freedom uh, requirements against biometrics, against, you know, all these kind of uh, uh, firewall which are <laughs> pushing out many uh, technologies. So it looks like a quite difficult <laughs> challenge. I mean, this is what I understand, not being a full expert. Uh. I want to start with this. Uh, I want to start. With, uh, this is not anarchy. We're not going to drop the government. We're not going to drop the, the police. Uh, they are an important trust entity actor in this ecosystem. With this type of um, of infrastructure in place, you can build more trust communities, more smaller trust actors. You don't have to rely on that one piece of puzzle, which is called the police, which is. The reason we have to stand in line for a passport, like let's say that you can have a trust community around a simple music festival. They don't need to rely on the police to to be able to build a trust in the, a week's thing. Like if we get if we get that infrastructure where things can be decentralized, you can everyone can start to put a layer of where do we put our trust, and then you can always look back to the police or the, the passport. Say okay, if you want really really high trust or want that piece of trust, we can also go to the passport. Uh, but it's like bank ID is relying on the passport. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, so the, the trust yeah. starts at somewhere, which yeah. is which is my which is my biggest question. Like, where does it begin? Um, but it's uh, I think that we have begun here in Norway, and if we allow this to just trickle out and and work in different sets of communities, I think we will have a lot of interesting trust frameworks in place. Mm -hmm. Because for a concert, okay, but when it's a question of who you are and your rights, uh, who you are and your money, <laughs> that's the not least. And it's another story. So yeah. it's not I think this is, uh, this is the main challenge of introducing this new type of ecosystem to establish those mm -hmm. communities. Because mm -hmm. those communities, they need to understand what, what, is, uh, what is the proposal here mm -hmm. and, and try to work to, to find them. Find ways they could uh, could use this uh, new type of uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good uh, good example. I think that's also maybe because I I don't know I don't know if the term wallet is a good one from a technical point of view, but from a user point of view, maybe that's the understandable one. Mm -hmm. Getting a user to understand decentralized what's my decentralized identity. No, just forget about it. Mm -hmm. That's that's a concept that doesn't fly. But for the EU system, it's, it is anchored uh, the official national identity. From national identity documents, that's where you start uh, mm. when you issue an EU wallet. That's the, that's the whole mm. idea. So you start from your official national identity, it's still national. Mm. And if you have multiple nationalities, we don't know yet if you will need one more wallet per nationality, if you can mm. use it. Um, yeah, different than that, but then I, I can imagine they dream mm. about to come an European identity for no. every no. citizen. No. no, it doesn't exist any common European identity, only national identities. Yeah, but Europe. they dream of a layer of that. There is a um, national yeah. identity which could be something like we uh, are all in Europe. No, 
Nope. No, um, uh, interconnecting is, is what they dream of. But that was still, I think, that could have been actually very well, the yeah. yeah. and so on. Uh, and then you are still in interconnecting the yes. ideas national. Yes. So it's not so revolutionary. And it's just the technology issue of decentralization, <coughs> blockchain, and Wait, the rest. Yeah, yeah. So think about it. There's one principle like. <laughs> Centralization versus decentralization is also always a pendulum going in both directions. Um, sometimes centralization will solve a problem to some extent, then you need to start pendulum towards decentralization. So there's a lot of main principles here that has to kind of come into place to really understand why, what this is trying to do. Um, because we can always say that, hey, let's put everyone under one database and say you, that's the glo your global identity. Uh, but that is too centralized and it's not going to work in innovation. It's going to break a lot of uh, different things that we have uh, that's easy to do when we have more flexibility and more interconnectedness rather than one centralized party that solves everything. Uh, and that, that interconnectedness is difficult to get in place. It's, got, it's put in place through standards, through collaboration, uh, through experimentation. Uh, there's also that's also a reason why Signicat, Din, Diwala, uh, I can't remember the others have delivered a, a research application on particularly this. Like, how do we interoperate? How can six wallets live together in this ecosystem? Mm. Uh, so, yeah. <coughs> but um, this concept of national identity is different from country to country, mm. as we know. Yeah. And uh, how to link them is not easy. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's, there's no EU identity and there's no idea of bringing about any EU identity, but there is an idea in ADAS on uh, making a system where it's possible to link an identity. So if I have a Swedish identity and a Norwegian identity, uh, Sweden and Norway can know it's the same person. And in this case, it could be quite simple, right? Because I have national identifiers in both countries. Mm -hmm. If you go to other countries in Europe, mm -hmm. there is no concept of a national identifier, not as the single number mm -hmm. like the Norwegian versus number that you need to identify you. Mm -hmm. uh, so ADOS 20 actually has a proposal to introduce such a number for cross-border traffic. Uh, I don't think it's going to get, go through, okay. but... Um, the concept is there in the, in the first ADAS proposal, ADAS 2.0 proposal. There's a set of attributes that mm -hmm. for cross-border purposes, these attributes identify you, and one of the attributes is a unique mm -hmm. identifier, persistent unique identifier mm -hmm. within your country. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always, it's yeah. important to remember also that, I mean, we, creating an over-national identity is challenging because this is a legal concept. I mean, yeah. all of us in here, I assume, have a, a we belong to a state. Mm. We have a nationality. There are very few stateless people. Well, there are stateless, but... And some have two. Right, and some, some have two, more than some one. Have more. And but it's not only about nationality, it also no. has to be... Residency. It's a residency, yeah. and it's also rights and obligations. Exactly. If you have a, the right to... If you, mm. An obligation could be you own a property in a country, you need to pay taxes there, uh, or a right, you work there once, so you get certain pension rights. Right. So, so it, I mean, okay. you've been there before, but uh, not anymore. Right. So there are different different ways of getting an identity in the state. Yes, mm -hmm. but ultimately the state is the one that can be yeah. defined on a legal mm -hmm. basis yeah. that I'm really John Eric Setsos and not somebody yeah. else. And mm -hmm. you know we're not changing that with mm -hmm. building, and that's what the EU says as well. <coughs> building on top of that. Is, is the passport number, isn't that a global sort of uh, identity? Yeah, but it's not persistent. It changes when you get a new passport every 10th year, or maybe it goes down to five years even. Uh, but that's still no much, uh, it's something that could be used. Yeah, right? it is used as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just, just on that topic, I mean, we're so used to our uh, first number that we, you know, we take it for granted. In a lot of countries, you don't have that persistent unique identifier for a number of political or, or um, social reasons. Yeah. Germany is one example. They don't have a unique persistent number. You have the passport number, which changes every time you get a passport. And they would strongly oppose a persistent identifier based on the uh, history from the Nazis. But you could uh, just update the passport number in your digital so identity wallet, right? Right, right but then you would yeah. need a challenge, you know, if, how mm -hmm. do you then make sure you link it to the same person all the time?
It's a different topic, but anyway, yeah. you get you start the wallet from your national identity, whatever yeah. that is, and then you, uh, then you can build on. Uh, this, but the ID is the ID basic ID is it's not like with bank ID today. You start from your national identity, and that identity is what you reveal every time you use the bank ID. You start from your national identity, and then you build a system where you reveal what is needed. Mm. But you build the trust from getting the attributes also based that uh, it's me. So when I get my university diploma from my university to prove I have the degree, uh, they can know it's me. And uh, yeah, yeah you, need, you need to have no. the, the, the wallet will need to have uh, the electronic identification, basically, mm. right? Mm. And this must be based on the national yeah. identity. Yeah. Mm. But uh, just a small comment on the, uh, we talk about the wallet and uh, asked about this uh, decentralized uh, identifiers mm. and systems, but I think the, the concept of wallet is uh, it's, uh, uh, to, to be, uh, uh, to, to help the users and give them, them an analogy back to the, the physical wallet. Mm. Uh, some of us still have physical ones, right? Mm. <laughs> we, we can pick up the different credentials, like mm. a driving license, uh, some uh, membership cards, etc. I think I think that's that's important to have mm. in mind when mm. we talk about what is the digital identity wallet. Mm. You have some core identity mm. solution that all the credentials we talk about, which is to be distributed and not known by anyone else or. Uh, anybody else besides you, uh, mm. which is uh, the owner, should have the full control of all these credentials. Mm. I think that's the way we should consider yep. the, the world yeah. concept. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I think it's really important to just tell a story. That I, how I want this to work is basically you download the wallet, when you have the wallet, open it, you get a set of keys, you get a persistent identifier. It's important to differentiate identifier with identity. Yeah. But you, can, you don't have to log in to anything to get the wallet. You have the wallet, and then, okay, right now, you're nobody. You're just an identifier, which you can reset and get a new set of keys uh, and reset again. But you need to start then picking small pieces of data to connect it to that identifier so that, okay, I want to take my passport. I connect it to that identifier. And I, then I go to a website, and they say, green login. I click the green login. We exchange on a standardized format with exchanging cryptographical signatures. Mm -hmm. So we have a connection, and then they ask me, hey, yeah, uh, we have this high level of trust, so we want to see your uh, your your passport, or we want to see that something that identifies you, we accept passport, driver's license, and something else. Mm -hmm. And then your app says, hey, you have a passport data blob here. Exchange that with this service, and you click exchange, and they can just read that and say, okay, that comes from Norway, and it's data, and the signature validates. Uh, that is the way you tie it back to a national yeah. identity. Yeah. But it's really important to remember that the wallet shouldn't necessarily, it, it's just a holder for that identifier, those cryptographical keys, and a place to start putting small pieces of data to kind of start populating that identifier into something that makes sense to other people. Mm. Yes, Yeah. It, it, it's just to, to add a bit more to that, because you know, it's if this, is to su succeed commercially. You mm. need to have this wallet, and you need to put the different pieces of information, like the Visa card, the MasterCard, if I have loyalty points I want to use to pay with, uh, if I want to open a door, all that kind of stuff mm. from Uncle Sam. And you also really need to have some kind of negotiation between the wallet holder and the place you try to use the wallet. Because me as a merchant, I might want to prefer a bank accept in top front of ESA, yeah. or points on top of that for cost reasons. So I really need to do that. Also, I think, you know what I hear? I hear one identity and one authentication. And it's really important for me as a merchant that I'm also able to scale the security. Typically, you know, if a customer comes and wants to buy a cup of coffee, I have a lot less security on it than if he wants to go and buy a TV. So me also, I need to be able to build this kind of user-friendly customer journeys at the point of interaction to ensure I scale the security, scale the services on who is where doing what. So do you think this will be part of the framework or do you think it's beside it? The scaling of security? Yeah. Everything I asked for, yeah. yeah. Scaling of security. You <laughs> know what everything is. Yeah, basically, me, for me as a merchant, being able to identify who are you, 
what are you doing, and then offer services and security based on that. Yeah. So, I, I, th I think it's, I think it's uh, part of the uh, part, part of the concept, at least yeah. in the uh, EIDAS regulation. I talk about uh, qualified uh, credentials, like qualified and non-qualified. Mm. I think for qualified, being that that's the highest level of security to, to be able to provide a qualified uh, electronically attested attribute, which is called kind of qualified verified credentials. That's the highest level. Mm. But they also talk about uh, non-qualified. Yeah. That means that uh, the level that, that's uh, at the lower security level, and I think that's the that's the way we could open up the infrastructure for this type of uh, solutions you are looking for. To, to, to have a lower level for providers who are willing to, to provide that type of credentials mm. used for services which do not uh, demand that high level of uh, assurance. Mm. So if, if you, the reason I said stories earlier, if you take the, if you walk through a user story and we can see if it meets your needs, you have a wallet, uh, that wallet can have now, it has a uh, MasterCard in it, <coughs> and it has um, a passport in it, and it has a driver's license. You go first to a cafe, and then that cafe says, pops up a, a QR code, which says, give me something that I can pay with. I accept all these types of data blobs, which has this type, which is where semantic data is really, really important in this whole view. So they say, we just want something that you can pay with. You scan a QR code and say, okay, the wallet says, yeah, yes, you have a MasterCard. You want to use that? Click, click that. That's sent over and they're doing the processing on a payment network. Great. It was just a coffee, so nothing more is needed. Um, you go onwards, you take the TV, you go and try to buy that. And then they say, okay, we need a payment thing, and you kind of scan it. And then, uh, or then there's another scanning that says, hey, we need to identify you because there's something important here. So, you, oh yeah, by the way, we also need your passport. You just tap the passport true, please. And then exchange, you are le a higher level up. And then it can be, um, to send your passport, you have to basically take your thumb and open the, the trusted uh, ecosystem inside the phone so you do the two-factor fa two authentication on top of that. And then you can get an email and say, hey, you just use your passport. You kind of have all that logging, the audit trails, and you've done that like level up for identification when you did try to purchase something more important. Uh, that way, like when the, the TV seller, he can basically initiate a payment with level two identification because that is needed right now. So you just do that as seamlessly exchange with one scan of QR code or NFC, which is just a transport of the data. But the receiver uh, then knows that the person that holds and controls this wallet is the person that identifies themselves with the passport. You don't need to do uh, physical biometric verification in any way because it's all connected with uh, cryptography. So there's a lot of cool new interactions we can get uh, doing this. Uh, also even with with uh, with buying a car, you can exchange your, your address and everything so that it's just automatically pre-populates everything into the system and it's just a simple tap of a phone. Yeah, and maybe with the passport, you don't need your first number, your unique identifier. No. But it needs to show your name and uh, that you have an official yeah. passport from Norway. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you don't need all information. That's also part of the game, right? Yeah. You, you exchange only certain attributes. So it's just about being able mm -hmm. to take a piece of data that mm -hmm. you expected and then verify that it comes from the person who is actually allowed to hold it, whether who did receive it. And then say that oh this comes from a signature that let's call it a simple list. It's the passport authority. Perfect, I trust it. Or the sys software will tell you that I trust it. And then it's all about all the UX and how we kind of abstract it for the simple clerk, the clerksman, or make it more complex for the people sitting in the back office trying to make sure that everything is correct. So yeah. Um, I have a question regarding like these attributes. In IDAS, have attributes that can be signed by a qualified signature and onboarded to your wallet. For instance, your driver license could be such an attribute. Mm. And you onboard it to your wallet, uh, and you can onboard like a lot of attributes. It could be passports or your MasterCard, like in your example. But then you actually are centralizing <laughs> your attributes. 
mm. into your orbit. Uh, I know it's some discussion about like having only references to where those attributes are stored. Mm. Uh, can you say a little bit about that? I don't heard about these references, but what is being worked on in the Decentralized Identity Foundation is called Secure Data Storage, where basically everything you um, you collect, you put and encrypt it, a little piece of metadata around it so that you, you, you're, you can give access to some service to authorize to read the right data. Uh, but at some point, it's, it's your data, so you put it in your little box. Uh, but if you want to be more cautious of kind of spreading that data around, then that's up to you or up to you choose the right wallet provider that offers that option. Yeah. Uh, or you go set it up yourself and you tell the wallet provider, here's the storage thing I want to use. Um, but, um, yeah, did I answer again, touch upon yeah. um, Anyway, for the new wallet, I think there there is a concept of, um, two ways you could do it. Either, if you want such an attestation, like a driving license, uh, you could store it and provide it, or you could fetch it when you need it. Uh, the advantage of the other second model is that the uh, revocation is implicit. Yeah. If your <coughs> driving license is, um, is revoked, you don't get it. But if it's stored in your wallet, mm -hmm. and you provide it, uh, the receiver might accept something that should have been revoked. Revoking, revoking attestations is a, is a hard one. And you don't want to revoke the entire wallet, right? You want to revoke, to revoke certain attributes, or certain attestations that are in there. Right. And at yeah. the same time, you don't want to tell the issuer of the driver's license who is taking it. Exactly. So well, that's, 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 the that's yeah. also where you can start using blockchain again, exactly. putting a revocation yeah. list yeah. on a blockchain yeah. that people can, it's just input, uh, not really output. Uh, so that's basically when you get this attribute, or I usually like to use the word verifiable credential, just to make it a little more difficult. Uh, they're all the same, uh, but it, you get this data blob and then it says the verifier software is Going to going through list and then checking that ref revocation list. Hopefully, that doesn't point to a source that's collecting uh, data about the user because that check is comes from let's say eBay checks this list based on user X and then you can start profiling around that mm. that that thing. So if it if it goes to blockchain, which you cannot profile on, just read is anonymous. No one can read that you have read something from blockchain. Um, then you can start having this uh, privacy preserving uh, revocation list. Yeah. So this is easier. This is actually one thing that's easier with the blockchain technology than with uh, other technologies. Uh, yeah. In this case. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it sounds like uh, we're talking about wallets, we're talking about blockchains. Uh, and there's a really good point about tying this up to Bitcoin now, which can be dangerous. Uh, but it sounds like it would make sense to potentially connect this to the digital euro and on the same uh, blockchain, right? Because that would simplify a lot of these issues, wouldn't it? Uh, is there any work on that? Uh, digital euro, is it uh, everywhere? And are they talking about interconnecting the two on a, on a same blockchain? Or do uh, you know anything about that? Uh, Digital currency and digital currency by central banks, certainly. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, digital, central, digital I think most, euro, well, I think a blockchain most, owned by yeah, European Most central bank. banks are working on that. I don't know exactly the status of the work, and I don't yeah. know uh, the connection to uh, European right. blockchain initiative or to what goes on with ADAS. Yeah, so there's that, no that, that, I don't know, that I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. ADAS 2 draft does not mention payments, but it occurs again for the, um, for the pilots. So I suppose there will be some work on that. Sounds like it would make sense to put yeah. on the same I, blockchain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, there is an initiative is a, yeah. to set up a European-wide blockchain with each country responsible for their separate nodes. Yeah, and yeah. That will give you a, uh, might not even agreement. might not be countries <laughs> because right. uh, the proposal is also that uh, Ledger is provider is a qualified trust service provider. So right. this means right. it could be a commercial actor and it could be something that's set up and valid across right. Europe. But it's at least then you will get uh, so it's an internal market thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's important, as you said, that the, uh, mm. the, the distributed ledger as a service is not a trust service, yeah. right? Exactly. So it's depending yeah. on if, if a 
private actor set up a uh, mm. distributed ledger as a service? Could that be used as a service for the, <laughs> the new wallet? It's, uh, for the wallet, <laughs> maybe, yeah. yeah. For yeah. the so currencies, <laughs> uh, maybe also, yeah. 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 We, we come, comments, sorry. Yeah, we <laughs> come <laughs> to the principle of <laughs> centralization, everything mm. on one thing versus moving yeah. towards decentralization mm. and building yeah. something that allows you to bridge between. Yeah. Like it, I've been a lot in the... In it, the DeFi space where you have maybe 10 blockchains and you can bridge your mm -hmm. coins yeah. mm -hmm. between everything. Yeah. That is makes more sense yeah. because people will have different focus, people have different uh, areas of expertise and deliver different services. So the, the pan panacea of everything into one, I don't think... It's not necessary. No. No. Right. Yes. Yeah. I just want to state that, you know, 70% of all the merchants active in the Norwegian market is present in more than one European market. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for yes. us to have the cross-border uh, in the change uh, is extremely important. Mm. And also what we use today, Visa MasterCard, mm. mainly is global standards. Mm. So even if we today uh, need to relate to the differences between Norwegian bank ID, Swedish bank ID, NEM ID, mm. you, 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 you name it, uh, for us to have a wallet that should work.